Hi there, and welcome to episode 29 of the Sage Running Podcast. Yes, we have brought it back. I'm joined here by Coach Sandy. First episode kicking off 2020. Uh, We wanted to give you a little update of what we've been up to, uh, training-wise, life-wise, things like that, as well as get into uh, at least some some social media and running media type of talk, perceptions on social media, kind of the psychology and and, uh, different aspects of the sport. Uh, the way we've been seeing it evolve over the several years, past five to ten years uh, in mutt running, as well as touch on some other things with women-specific training, uh, endurance considerations, things like that. So welcome back, Coach Sandy. Thanks. And uh, yeah, we want to update our listeners. If you're tuning in on iTunes, we're also going to try to distribute in the future on Spotify as well as, what's the other one, Stitcher? (laughs) I don't know. I listen to that. Um, podcast on iTunes or just for right from the website normally. Yeah, and we, we are uploading this on the YouTube video, of course. Uh, we're not looking at you on the screen because we were trying to do this thing where we're actually like having a conversation like, yeah. like other podcasts. Yeah, body language. That's important for conversations. We're going to get into that. Body language, uh, yeah, tone of voice, things like that. Not just words that you see like on a, a short tweet or something like that. So we'll dig into that. But let's start off with updating people what you've been up to, Coach Sandy. Oh, we're going to start with me. Um hard to know where to start it's a big question um but i guess it's been a long time since we've done a podcast so uh feel like what people probably want to know most about is racing and training um and i I, if you don't know i've had uh an achilles slash peroneal tendon issue for sorry coach sage is fixing my microphone because he knows i don't talk loud enough um (laughs) try to talk louder so maybe that's something else i'll talk about too but getting back to the achilles perennial tendon have had issues with that for a really long time um so many opinions and appointments over the years to try to figure out and uh earlier well not earlier this year but back in summer went to see a bunch of different doctors uh to get different opinions and it got a bunch of different like surgery options but uh one doctor who is more of a um, specialist for with that works with athletes and specifically runners. It's like you haven't tried shockwave therapy yet. You know, I only think there's like a forty percent chance it's going to work for you. But before I operated, I would have you try shockwave therapy. So I tried shockwave therapy um, at Boulder Valley Foot and Ankle is actually where I got it done. But the doctor was from um, CU Sports Medicine, um, who I actually liked. I saw other doctors and like. The surgery options are just like no way. And you could just tell the doctor wasn't used to working with athletes. So um, getting out, losing my chain of thought. But anyway, shockwave therapy at Boulder Valley Foot and Ankle. And uh, it ended up working. It was hard. Shockwave therapy going into it it was kind of hard because like what if I spent all this time doing it and it doesn't work and I'm just have to do surgery and drag the process out longer. Cause the thing with shockwave therapy, you do three treatments, um, one every single week for three to four weeks. And then you just wait for about, um, 12 weeks total and see if it works. So I did that and it helped a lot, but it wasn't perfect. So then I did a second round of shockwave therapy. And so I'm not quite at the 12, um, end of 12 weeks with that, but it's a huge improvement. Uh, it's, if you've been in chronic pain for like many, many years, to suddenly have that pain go away and not to think about it all the time, like you just feel like you have so much more energy. And for me, when I do run, it is so much more enjoyable because of that. But um, not out of the woods yet, not perfect. And so I've been running more. Um, but I just did like a first kind of like little fartlek session on the Saturday. And this was after months and months of avoiding speed workout and stuff but um the big thing I'm working on now which is really a pain in the butt is that after moving through pain for so many years is your body always wants to move around that pain and so now I just 
that's what like all my body is used to doing is moving around this pain. And so there are just so many little things I have to work on to get back to running how my body's supposed to. It's not like my body can do what it's supposed to, but it just doesn't want to because it's not used to it. And so it's just a really long process and a lot more appointments. I'm working um, – with a really um, amazing physical therapist at CU Sports Medicine named Christy Barth, and she's also the gait analysis person there. Um, so she's really good at looking at my gait when I run. Like each session starts off with me running on a treadmill, and then we'll um, watch myself. I'll watch myself run in, in slow motion, and we'll compare videos to see like how much I improved from the last time. So she's amazing. But I'm also seeing um, other people. Like after later today, I have an appointment. Um, with Boulder Sports Chiropractic to hopefully just help me keep things loose and make sure there's nothing like causing me to twist through my pelvis and stuff like that. So um, running more, anyway, long story short, running more, hopefully be racing um, late spring, maybe not till summer. It's, it's, I've been, I don't want to sign up to a race until like I know I'm fully, fully ready um confident I will be racing soon this year which I know um would love uh to wear my topo athletic shoes they've been so, so supportive during this whole process and um really thankful for them uh, hanging in there with me uh but I, I, I'm hopeful and uh so if, and I know a lot of people have asked me to like do videos on Achilles stuff um and, and I will, I do have this document I made for my athlete, which is with a ton of different resources and, and the best Achilles protocol, but I've been hesitant to it because there's so many things that can tweak your Achilles or, or also like my peroneal tendon too got tweaked. So um, that's kind of where I'm at with running. Um, there's all like life stuff too, like um, I guess I'll just flow with it. i um, been trying to do YouTube more lately. Um Although not, not lately because you've been in New Zealand and now I kind of feel like my head's still underwater trying to catch up a little bit. Uh, but YouTube, I love that it gives me a space to help people for free. But it is the most uncomfortable space I could also put myself in. Um, like Sage, like you're such a natural talker where for most of my life I'm just very reserved and I'm okay with keeping thoughts to myself and never saying anything out loud or just being a very few words. And so podcasting, which I'm also like trying to trying to do this podcast and YouTube, it forces me to talk and put thoughts together and try to be more confident talking in front of people. Um, and it's just, it's a great challenge, but it's a very uncomfortable one for me. So I hope um, when people watch my YouTube channel and sometimes I stumble over my words or I look nervous it's because I am nervous but I hopefully it comes with the understanding that we all have our challenges we're working through and I'm trying to do mine in a fairly public way which is incredibly scary at times but also empowering when I, I can do it a couple of weeks ago I did my first video where I didn't have Sage how to do like a second take or anything which is like such a huge win like it seems like such a little thing but normally like I'm always like stumbling over my words or like thinking too much about what I'm saying and like judging myself as I talk so um yeah and this is probably the first time I did a podcast where I spoke most of the intro without Sage having to ask me questions or anything so but now it's time to pass it off to Sage I've talked enough well yeah I mean there's yeah certain vulnerabilities opening up on social media public communication uh, and your injury talk I'm sure a lot of you could relate to maybe getting a running injury and, and kind of the struggles that come through that so kudos to Sandy uh, for sharing that publicly and hopefully in a way that that other people could learn from and benefit from to get over your injury quicker or to avoid that injury in the first place and she said mentioned seeing running form experts we really like the science behind it video analysis as well as digging into those different muscle groups how your running form functions things like glute activation which i've kind of been personally been struggling with over the last several years and i'm actually starting to think part of it's our mattress that we're sleeping on upstairs there in the yeah, loft it's uh, a lot of things. we are in the studio here and it's a studio because it literally is a studio apartment this is a 400 square foot space where we sleep in we cook in uh, and we make podcasts and media, all our videos, all our work is done 
in this one room, uh, but really thankful to be here in Boulder, Colorado. Sandy plugged her title sponsor. Uh, you want to? You could plug. I guess we'll do a sponsored break <laughs> ad. Th- first of all, thanks to all the Patreon supporters for really making the Sage Running Podcast mm-hmm. possible. All this audio gear, the technology to be able to pull this off, uh, and the work to put into it. Hopefully, we could be more consistent with our uploads this year because we've been slacking on the podcast. But do want to bring it back. It's an uncomfortable media for me to work in as well because it's new. Uh, but that's why we do it on, on YouTube and, and we'll cross promote it on all our social yeah, media I'd love platforms. to dig in some more like running science stuff. A lot of good things to talk about lately, but for another day. Yes. Not yes. other things to talk about today. Yes. But yeah, I would love Always to learning. talk about like supplements and like different workouts and Yeah, as well as nutrition or yeah. even comments from you guys if you're able to comment on this YouTube video or just, you know, tweet at us. Uh we have, you know, our business handles at Sage Running on Instagram and Twitter as well as a Facebook page. because uh, we don't always see a lot of those personal facebook messages or instagram messages it's better to actually comment on the yeah. business page uh subscribe to, uh, check out our website sagerunning.com for any service yeah. any distance and i just i'll thank title sponsor hoka one one keeping the dream alive as a professional mountain ultra trail runner of course uh we work in coaching a lot well sandy mainly sandy does the work uh co-founder of sagerunning.com and she also helped develop all the training plans on there we got stuff from 5K, 10K, all the way to ultra marathon. But enough self promotion and business plugs here. Uh, let's talk about, I guess, well, for my update, you've seen it on the YouTube channel. Maybe we went to New Zealand, raced the Tarware 100K. Wasn't a very good race for me. I don't want to be like full of excuses, but I would say the limiting factor was uh, some skeletal muscular problems, hip mobility, glute activation, just running with bad, inefficient form. That kind of leads you into bonking early or getting kind of dehydrated overworking yourself just not being as efficient basically so uh and just being in a lot of pain actually during the race so uh sandy was out there crewing she could relate to that i actually wanted to drop out with about 12 miles to go she made me fight through it finished fifth uh in eight hours 50 i think it was 52 minutes i don't know i wasn't happy with the time i wasn't happy with the place and i mainly just wasn't happy with how i felt everything else would have been executed great uh spring energy was going down well spring energy nutrition Intercode Sage at myspringenergy.com, as well as Intercode Sage at CorelessGlobal.com. For if you get a watch, GPS watch, you get a free item from the the website there. Okay, that's enough sponsor. Well, since you said spring for another nutrition option, you could do Unived Nutrition, which is exciting things coming. um, Partnership with me and them later this year. Okay, enough sponsor plugs. Uh, we'll probably plug something else at the end. Um, But thanks to the Patreon support. Thanks for all you for tuning in to these podcasts. Uh, Go ahead. Well, can we keep talking about how you've been feeling lately? I think this is worth digging into. About my hip and back? Well, it was, so was your limiting factor mechanical issues or bio, biomechanical issues? I would say it's it's hard to say because there's usually a combination of things that start slowing you down in an ultra, right? Mm-hmm. You could mentally be out of it. And well, you get what was it for you thoughts. specifically? I think, and I could be wrong, uh, is that it was mainly mechanical. I was also fairly dehydrated at the end, but that's pretty much par for the course. I think I'm usually pretty dehydrated at the end of an ultra, especially in warm conditions. Do you think uh, training face... would have helped before there is? Slightly, but I don't think it was a dehydration you know, issue as much. I was drinking consistently. Because... I was fueling consistently. But dehydration, it would make all your muscles have to work harder because the blood flow is not good. You're not getting enough as much oxygen and nutrients going to your muscles, harder to contract your muscles. So that could be part of biomechanical stuff. Yeah, I, I felt my hip pretty early on, like about 16 miles into the race uh, before I was getting dehydrated. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, like I said, it all ties together. You start feeling some pain. You start changing maybe your stride subconsciously. You start becoming more inefficient. I also kind of went for it. Tom Evans, who eventually won and destroyed us, uh, yeah, you're in a great was race. trying to trying to get away and i was trying to chase him uh whereas some of my hoka teammates like chris brown pat reagan uh maybe i should have stayed with them uh because chris brown ended up getting third and being the top american finishing on the podium and there were a couple other guys that passed me along the way as well so you know i was going backwards uh the only scientific data and this is the important thing with getting into objectiveness uh actual concrete numbers and outside perspective is that they did put me in the medical tent after I crossed the finish line because I did lose over, gosh, I, th- I think it was five kilograms 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure now. It was a lot. It was like nine. Four kilograms. Was it four? Okay, it was four kilograms. So they weigh us the day before. I was wearing street clothes though. Like I could have been a little heavier because of that. I did take off my shoes before they weighed me the day before the race, and then after the race, when I crossed the finish line, they weighed me when I had my shoes on. So you know that's a pound difference. About. um, So I did lose a lot of fluid, but I think a lot of people were dehydrated, and I didn't feel particularly extra dehydrated, but for sure it's a factor for sure it's a factor as well as you know your mental space if you're like oh i'm in pain oh you know i'm losing you could get negative and and it makes the pain worse and it makes you not push as hard as you should maybe in the last 20 miles or 32k of the race so that you know that's a factor as well i fully admit to that uh there's too much self-bias sometimes when you're just thinking about your own feelings during a race and what could have you know i don't want to say excuses but you know trying to look at this objectively and scientifically on how to improve. Okay, but I'm, I haven't warned you about this, some of the questions I was planning to ask, but one thing I wanted to talk about, because you said it's mechanical issues, is when you look at other professional runners, especially road runners, they have a team of people behind them, and they're getting like weekly massages, they're getting chiropractic work done, or physical therapy, like they're constantly going to see somebody to make sure everything is working properly. You are very opposed to that. It is very hard to even get you to into like see you sports medicine for somebody to analyze your gait and give you suggestions. Like you went once and got some tips, but in my experience, physical therapy, yeah, you, it's good to get multiple opinions, but in order for anything to be helpful, you have to go multiple times to make sure things are actually improving and you get more exercises as you go. Um, and so... I just want to get your thoughts on that because I sometimes I feel like it would be helpful for you to have somebody look at you with a different perspective and give you feedback and so you can avoid some of these mechanical issues that you've been having and also you've been having lower back pain for a really long time now and you haven't been able to fix it yourself so I was wondering just all your thoughts like and I know you have different thoughts on why your back hurts but I think it gets worse sometimes when you're running. Um, so I just, I want to hear your thoughts on that. Like, why don't you have more people around you trying to help you out? I agree. Uh, we actually don't get free support in, in Boulder right now for those things. So it's expensive. So that's one. Yeah, it is very expensive. And it takes extra time. That's another thing. I like to film and make YouTube videos and spend my time editing and playing guitars and goofing around. Um, so, you know, there's, I, I have no excuse at the time. Uh, and you know, we are sponsored. So, you know, financially, it's 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 possible. It it could be very expensive. Uh, I think I think that is a lot of struggle. It's my struggle getting to work. Um, it's not like we're making a. I'm not making a huge amount of money coaching because that's not why I do yeah. it. So it is it is a huge financial. You're struggle talking for a lot about people. other professional athletes. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have Olympians in Boulder. We have people that yeah. make world teams in track and and road marathon running, uh, who likely have maybe more capital <laughs> to, yeah. to to play with, but. You know, it's it's about leveraging contacts uh, on the local level for your support system, and I agree with outside perspective. I think there are some things I immediately could do at home here in the office. First thing is this chair. This is a horrible chair. Uh, it's great for sitting at the bar here, but this is where I work. This is the kitchen mm-hmm. counter. It's my work desk, and I hunch over with horrible form. I'm doing my horrible form hunch. It hurts my neck. My neck really hurt during the race. Uh, it was in a, being in a sitting position, working at your computer or laptop generally is very bad. It shortens your hip flexors. It puts your, your pelvis in an anterior pelvic tilt position. Uh, and I'm getting older. I'm getting older. I've been running year round for 20 years, over 20 years, super high mileage. Your hip flexors are probably going to start getting tight after that, right? High mileage training, getting into my thirties, sitting a lot with bad form. So the solutions I see right away you know, sleeping on a really crappy, cheap mattress that's over seven years yeah. old where their springs are collapsing in the middle. It is pretty bad. And I actually didn't notice that until we came back from New Zealand. We've been sleeping in, you know, hotel mattresses and, and uh, Airbnb mattresses that were way higher quality than what we sleep on at home. Mm-hmm. I came back the first night and I haven't been running. I've been taking a break since Tarawera. And my back was just, it hurt when I wake up. It hurts more when I wake up in the morning than any other time during the day. And so I'm like, oh, I think it's time to replace this mattress. So yeah, replace the mattress, get a standing desk. I'm going to update my computer equipment. I uh, have a really old 13-inch MacBook Pro here that we do all their editing and work on uh, and have a, something where I could stand up, get that 
get that pelvis straight, right? Get out of that anterior pelvic tilt, stretch those hip flexors out more, do little exercises around the house, like a lunge stretch and things like that. Then if that doesn't work, then I'll start seeing a, a you know, physical therapist. Um, Cause I think, you know, there's little things you could all do at home first that might help a lot before we have to shell out a bunch of money to see a specialist. Um, Cause the root problem could be at home. That's so. That's my take on but, that. So to play the devil's advocate, it's it's not like you just started having these problems. You've already had a lot of these problems for years, back and forth. And so now I feel like you've already tried to do a lot of stuff yourself. Well, I I haven't gotten we haven't got a new mattress and no. I haven't got a new workstation. And I think those are leading causes yeah. culprits. And I do think like part. But, of- and I'm also getting older. <laughs> so. Yeah. You know, a couple but I years also ago, like, I guess you haven't really been stretching your hip flexors, and that's something I try to do every day now because my physical therapist got on me for it. She's like, "You don't have the hip extension, you can't access all the power in your glutes," and like that was enough motivation for me to get on it every single day. And this is a common problem that hopefully a lot of you could relate to. Maybe uh, I'm not going to say. I mean, there's all sorts of things that could cause injury and pain in your lower back lumbar region. Uh, from leg length discrepancy to just you start getting uneven tightness on one side versus the other there's torque with each thing in your stride it could be a running shoe issue it could be a training issue there's hundreds of variables that could go into play here but what we do see with tight hip flexors is when it starts pulling on the the, the hip uh the front of the pelvis it could also be a tight uh, rectus formis the front of your quad i know that's very tight too the quads get overdeveloped they get very tight they get very rigid you start losing activation on the back part of your leg, your posterior chain. So the gluteus maximus, right? The heart of your butt, basically. And as well as the hamstrings and calves, I've actually felt like they've atrophied over the years. uh, And the quads have gained this this more mass and weight, which is kind of dead weight, actually, for uh, at least climbing and running flat, fast paces. But I was able to flip the switch last year for Pike's Peak. I got second to Killian there. Hope to peak for Pike's Peak again this year when Killian comes back and do that Golden Trail series of short distance mountain running. So I know it takes a lot of concentration. It takes some extra work. But if you could flip that switch with your running form and still have that cardiovascular fitness uh, and just stay healthy and train train well with smart workouts, then you're going to get closer to reaching your potential. And it's going to be a lot more rewarding. And that's what I want to try to do again this summer, this spring. Yeah. I mean, you're actually a professional athlete. It's so rare to actually get paid to like do a sport. And I just feel like you should just take full advantage of this time in your life and just have all the help you can get because it's not going to last. Yeah, I don't take a single day for granted. I mean, and a lot of it's been from the support of, of people like you that support the companies that sponsor me. That's what really all makes it possible. So uh, it's all a, a team effort. And uh, yeah, thankful to be in this position. At the same time, I feel like some athletes do themselves a disservice because they don't have another part-time job. Oh, totally. And they don't. I, I have a passion for like doing the YouTube channel, working in media, coaching, uh, spending time doing things like this rather than just being, oh, no, I'm only an athlete, right? I don't do anything else. I just eat, sleep, and run. Uh, I think that's great to reach your potential, but at the same time, I think sometimes it's good to have a balance. Uh, like when I ran my marathon PR 216 in the marathon, I was still working 30 hours a week. Actually, I cut back to 20 hours a week in the shoe store at Hanson's Brooks, right? We weren't full-time athletes. We were working in the shoe store part-time still. I fully agree with that. I do think it's really important to have other things that you care about and want to do like especially like since I've haven't been racing and stuff like coaching I absolutely love coaching and just to be able to turn more energy to doing that and also been working on a bunch of like little side projects which kind of talk about a little bit later on um, has been invaluable for me Um, but at the same time it's like you know you only have this little bit of time to be a professional and get paid for what for running and you should just take full advantage of it. Yeah, I guess in my mind, I'm hoping uh, that I could keep this high level of running going. And even as I get older, I do think you like you have a, quite a few more years ahead of you, but still like, you know, at a certain point, like you're not going to get paid to, to run competitively anymore. Like maybe you also get something like as a master's runner, but it's not going to be the same. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, you know, I envision my career at least, hopefully. Uh, and like you said, you never know. I'm mm-hmm. going to get in a car accident and lose my leg and not, not be able to run a step tomorrow. So, I mean, there's no guarantees in this sport. But, you know, 
yeah, with the sponsorship, it's very competitive. It's very hard. Uh, you do it out of the sake of loving the sport and loving running and seeing self improvement. And I see my hopefully better years, at least at the longer ultras, hundred k, hundred miles, to be in my mid to late thirties. There's no reason I uh, even a, a guy. Uh, guys usually have less longevity than women. Um, in, in endurance running from what we've seen, I mean, there's women in their forties and fifties that are yeah, competitive on the world it. stage, but there's still guys in their forties that are still smashing races like UTMB and hard rock and, and especially the hundred mile distances. So I don't see, I don't want to use age as an excuse. People are like, Oh, you're, you're too old now. You're, you're 34 years old. Like you're over the hill. Sage, you should retire now. I get these comments sometimes. Uh, but I, I don't see it that way. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm not going to set my 5k PR probably anytime soon, but I'm not going after that anymore. Even the road marathons kind of like, okay, maybe that ship sailed. Uh, I still think I could run under 219 again, but who knows what they'll do with the trial standard. Yeah. Uh, and that's a whole nother discussion uh, with road running, but yeah, I mean, it's, you're right. I, I should do more. Uh, it's all about working hard, trying to be objective and realizing that there is a lot of self bias and this comes in to hold the whole social media presentation too, which I did want to touch on in this this podcast. Ray, I'll let you dig into that because I know you have a lot of thoughts on Twitter and and trying to have intelligent discussions when you can't hear somebody's tone or or see their body language and stuff. Yeah. So like how can you have an intelligent discussion and not have ego get involved too much or just start assuming things about what somebody's saying it's hard it's hard and a lot of miscommunication and uh things happen i think because of the nature of social media and being being in the coaching in the coaching business being uh sponsored athletes or just being a regular human being right most people on earth are probably on facebook who have access to the internet realize it is a, a first world type of luxury but uh social media and how it's shaped our lives, especially probably in the last 10 years, um, in specific to the context of the running community and thoughts in, in just running. Obviously, there's a whole whole world with the social media and different sports and uh, from cooking to vlogging and, and attention seeking, I guess you could say, uh, is the thing that, like you said, a lot of communication, I don't know what the statistic, the number is, was it 83% maybe of communications considered non, yeah, it is nonverbal. Like or it's it's not the word choice that matters so much. It's it's body language. Body language is huge when you're communicating to someone. Hence the value of in person communication, right? Yeah. The other factor with communication that has a high percentage is your tone, your vocal tone, facial expressions. Mm-hmm. It's part of body language, but tone of voice, how you convey a message, uh, is very important for conveying meaning, uh, even if it's picked up kind of at a subtle type of level. Then comes word choice. Word choice is like the smaller factor in actual communication. So what we see on social media comments, like it could be on a Facebook comment thread. It could be on an Instagram comment thread, YouTube comment thread. But especially, (laughs) I've, I've thought about this recently, on Twitter, where you are very limited to how many words you would write in a specific tweet and whether or not you're hitting reply all or you're just replying directly to someone in a community communication type of discussion or argument or passionate debate, however you want to say it, uh, is that word choice becomes that much more important because we lost tone, we lost context of body language, we lost all these things. So it's very easy, I think, to spread the wrong message to to for people to read what you wrote maybe in a way that you didn't intend. Um, so a lot of miscommunication happens that way. And especially because of Twitter, you're limited with characters. The way the discussion threads are presented is kind of confusing when you look at tweets in a long thread of multiple people either hitting reply all or directly commenting. uh, Things kind of get lost in the mix, so the flow of the conversation could get diluted, and when that happens, you start seeing more misunderstandings happening, and I realize this more and more. I've been reading this book. I think it's called Think Fast and Slow. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure think slow and fast uh it's really good i just started it i don't know much about it but it kind of goes it starts off with talking about the idea of self-bias and how we're all inherently self-biased and how that obviously is going to affect your perception of reality your perception is what reality and it may not be what another person's perception or reality is like we're talking about cameras it's like having a different lens on your camera right some people see the world 
Oh, I got a, uh, our camera actually just went off. I'm going to go hit, hit reset real quick. All right, back recording. So yeah, as I was saying, it's like, uh, different camera lenses on a camera. If you have an inner, you could change the lens. You could have a wide angle lens. You could have a long lens, uh, different lenses that we see the world in as individuals because we're all different we all have different perceptions and biases biases um and so the fallacy that I, you know i make and i think maybe others make is that you think people see the world through the same lens that you do right maybe they, they see it in color and you see it in black and white that's not a good comparison maybe but you know what i mean like you see things through a different perception and that mm -hmm. perception is what you think is reality it may or may not be reality it may not be what the majority of people see uh or it might just be a small part of reality yes and so the whole idea with with getting to this was talking about science and good science and the thing that always drew me to science was that the whole idea is to try to eliminate bias yeah, in a well, nutrition study for example okay. try to minimize control for variables minimize bias of the researcher mm -hmm. itself right and that's what I think can be great about Twitter is like one of the main reasons I'm Twitter on Twitter is like one to follow races two it's because I follow a lot of good researchers and even other coaches on Twitter and there can be some really amazing information but for a lot of the reasons you suggested where people just get into silly arguments a lot of times I'm not on Twitter sometimes I'll just repost an article or a research study that I think is interesting and then I don't go on Twitter for another month. So um, I don't know. I think sometimes the negativity of Twitter is a really big turnoff for people, but which is a shame because there's also so much great information or could be such great information and discussions on Twitter if people used Twitter for intelligent discussions that could actually help people especially like researchers sharing studies um and giving a little insight to the public like it, it that's really valuable yeah and the, the other component with that self-bias thing and the mis misinterpretations of tweets or comments uh you know people have a 180 degree different perspective on something that you have and it's hard to relate to that and i think then because people get frustrated you let emotions run your comments and i've been definitely at fault for this right i get emotional i'm i'm have ocd i'm obsessive uh and i will just grind on a discussion or comment thread till the very end uh it, to a point to a fault really and it's because you know i get emotionally involved in it and that's bad that's bad. That's a mistake. Like, well, I think it you carries don't, over you, too because sometimes you get like in a Twitter heated discussion and then you're telling me about it and then I just feel like it's making me have higher anxiety or like my mood changes because of it because it just, again, it's just such a big turn off for Twitter that way. And it's like what's like nothing positive is happening in this situation. True. The negative energy is not good. And we'll try to work. I'll try to work <laughs> on improving that in the future at the same time. And I have a pet peeve on this and maybe it's my distorted perception of reality. Again, uh, we see a lot of, you know, people that you, you get irrational, basically, when emotions run your, your thoughts and comments and you get miss, maybe you feel like you're not being heard, I guess, is the other frustration. But at the same time, I think you have to stand up for what you believe in and stand up for what you see is right. Uh, if it's, in fact, uh, someone stepped on your toes in a certain way to speak up about it, right? So we have issues with, you know, there's a lot of cases this year, a couple I could think of at least, where, you know, female athletes have been abused in some sense by uh, older male coaches, right? It's not a generalization to say, oh, all male coaches, endurance coaches in the sport are bad no it's probably a small percentage but mm. to recognize that hey this is actually a problem and you know more often than not uh when people get in positions of power sometimes they abuse them uh in general right and that women <laughs> have been discriminated <laughs> historically not just in in distance running and sport and misrepresented uh at a disproportionate level and i think statistics actually prove and show this it's not me making a, a generalization 
Oh, for sure. But uh, some people it's like to college well, and, and that's, vision, that's why I, which I, is I a, dig the my issue heels with Twitter. <laughs> Another example, not going to name any names, uh, is if people are, were talking about diet and a uh, very hotly debated comment topic because obviously it's tied with your, it could be tied to religion, it could be tied emotionally, strong emotional ties, culture. family traditions, culture, yeah. right? Uh, the appeal of eating home cooked meal, what you like, your favorite foods, strongly tied to emotion, but also strongly tied to science, right? And, uh, you know, if someone in the media says a statement about me in a, in a declarative fact, Sage only believes this, he definitely believes that being vegan is the only way to go. That's not fair because that's an untrue statement. That's a lie. It would be perfectly fine if you're stating your opinion. If you say, I think Sage thinks the vegan diet is the best, or it seems like Sage is very militant about his vegan diet. That's fair game. That's fair game. That's a that's a an opinion type of comment, but you can't make a definitive fact statement type of comment when it's wrong or you're going to get called out on it uh, because then you start going down a very slippery slope of libel and uh, – and defamation basically uh or is it right. slander slander spoken uh either one libel written so you know i see that as a problem i call that out uh because it's, it's important for facts it's important for uh logic but i think it needs to be called out in a way that understands that people m make mistakes and sometimes you say things too quickly without thinking about it and everybody does that we we've certainly faulted in that because people are passionate so it's like how do you respond in a way that that doesn't match the negativity and can actually raise the conversation up to be more insightful for people it's true that's a good point it is true um that being said you know the news and these things are very near and dear to my heart because we see other cases in the media like doping allegations cases, another pet peeve of mine, right? Clean sport. Uh, you know, people lying on the record to uh, being investigated, right? It's a case, won't name any names. <laughs> people ask repeatedly the same question. Have you gotten L-cartanine injections? Have you, uh, you, you know, have you ever gotten them? No, I haven't. Uh, did, you know, this doctor give them to you? Nope. <laughs> Never, never had them. Never had them in my life. Then instantly the stories change later. Oh, you know what? I actually forgot. I, I actually did get injections. Conveniently after meeting with someone who may have testified the actual truth. So for me, it's a pet peeve of, of truth and finding the truth and stating actual real facts uh, instead of making up fake news, broadcasting misinformation, things that hurt people's career that are just simply untrue. Right. I do think there are so certain So I get very things. emotional about that. Well, I, do I get think very emotional about there that. There are certain topics where like, you know, I was saying like make things more positive, but there are certain topics where you're not going to make something positive and you do need to call people out because when you do that, other people are less likely to do the same things. And I think that's really key with these cases we've seen with female athletes, especially that have been abused and manipulated and taken advantage of exactly. by- uh their coaches right like we we have to talk about that and just admit there's there's nothing really a way to turn those stories and something positive like yeah you can say like oh they got better and or the woman they 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 had therapy and they're okay now but that situation will never be positive and will never be okay like what some of those women went through yes and, and so it's I important to call that out Yes, it's important to speak up and be silent. And you know, like I said, I've I tend to be pretty fiery and yeah, we're both passionate people. That's um, for sure. And to a fault. And so yeah, we make we make mistakes as well. And I would appreciate if someone when people do call me out on that, and hopefully could find the the power to apologize. I guess uh, if you state a, a fact that's a wrong, blatantly wrong fact, we try to be careful with what we say, even in this podcast and on mm -hmm. media, to not give people bad information to not say oh yeah you know vegan diet 100 percent will work for all people and is the best diet period we think it could help a lot of people become very healthy and it's a great diet for runners and it's a great diet for us but i would never say 100 percent guarantee this diet is the best for everyone because i know people have there's there's all sorts of variations with with our genetics there's people that have certain 
conditions that may limit them in what types of foods they could eat and things like that. Um, and obviously, when you just say vegan diet, you, you, we generally mean whole foods plant-based, to clarify that, right? I could eat vegan ice cream all day, and it would be a terribly unhealthy diet mm -hmm. full of, of refined sugar and, and more processed things. But uh, whole foods plant-based kind of gets into the idea of eating whole fresh vegetables and fruits and whole grains. Right. And, it, and then diet's a hard topic because there are just so many myths around it right now and so much bad research that will so many people don't view as research that has some major issues in it because they don't know how to read research studies and or they just don't have the time. And um, it's really hard to know it all and to know to really look at be like, hey, these researchers manipulated this data and that's bad. Um, and that's and then there's just people just making up myths like saying um, because we eat plant based or or vegan that um, we're limiting our diet, even though like I would totally eat like a vegan burger and stuff. Um, well, it's a funny like, unfair yeah. double standard too. Yeah, it's a very double standard. You get injured, it's because of your diet. Right. I have a bad race. Some people will say, I guess, it's because of my diet. Yeah. Well, there's other people that eat maybe the standard American diet or a more uh, popular diet, we should say. They get injured. Oh, no, you wouldn't get accused of that, right? So it's it's interesting. It may or may not be my diet. I'm not saying it's not my diet. I don't think it is, but uh, it's it's there's this weird double standard, and you know part, part of it's the game of putting yourself out there on social media. I re I realize that it's a double edged sword, and that's the whole thing of the positive and negative. We want to try to spread the truth and real news and facts to help benefit other people, hopefully, yeah, and benefit it's... ourselves and improve our own running, but hopefully something that's educational. Yeah, and even if like somebody doesn't agree, I just would hope that they're not spreading perpetual myths. Um, about being plant-based because there's just so much of that going around now and that that's hard to take my camera just ran out on its sd card i thought i had cleared enough space uh, i'm trying to think if we'll just keep we'll just keep the audio going so the uh -huh. youtube video will be kicked out at this pace but i think we're kind of getting to a point where maybe we could start wrapping up you did want to touch on maybe the some of the new training angles you've been looking at speaking of new perspectives well and i've been science. looking at this stuff for a long time um and it's really about female physiology and also bringing that knowledge to male coaches who work with female athletes because it's such important topic and it's been changing so much over the past i don't know even like four or five years um I was recently listening to a podcast with Stacey Sims who wrote the book Roar, Roar, which is incredibly popular with female athletes right now. And she said she drew rewrite, rewrite a couple of the chapters at this point. And um, I've heard some people recent, also recently say that, oh, her book is the training Bible, but I don't even think she would agree with that for a woman right now. And I read stuff in the book. It was so much great information, but you know, other people do have opposing views and so I think it's good to take all that research in but um, there are some uh, there are definitely things that all like uh, male coaches and all female coaches and female athletes could be using to their advantage right now and um, with the data that we know about our cycles and um, what we can do to just perform well at any time or um, and so there's a lot of research on the subject but there is a way to make it more straightforward. And so that's what I'm working on right now. I want to make this really simple um, image with a few resources that women and coaches can take and be like, this is what you need to do at certain times of your cycle to optimize your performance. Uh, I'm trying to think where I want to go with this. And so, well, I'll start off with saying, so one thing I recently did that I hope if you're a coach listening to this, that if you haven't already, you could do this too. So I started asking questions um, on my athlete intake form which everybody does as soon as I get a new athlete um, so specifically specific question for me females like um, do you get your period do your period on a regular basis um, do you know how to do you track your cycle um, there's a great app called fitter woman I think there's another app for uh, female athletes now where you could track your cycle and it also gives um, tips along the way to optimize performance and like when you should focus on recovery more. Um, so I've been asking, so I have a whole series of questions just for women regarding that. And then I'll use that information to be able to better help them and make sure they're on track. Um, and it's uh, for a few other notes on that topic. Um, 
think it's interesting. We talked about this before because it's something you didn't know that um, about uh, intermittent fasting or doing uh, fat burning runs for um, for distance runners, especially um, where there is some evidence that that's good for men. Although we are we had an off topic subject, well, kind of that it can sometimes hurt men's testosterone, but uh, we're focusing on women here. Um, I think it, it it could your testosterone and a lot of hormone levels are going to fluctuate throughout the day, just depending on the timing of the day, but mm-hmm. then also the timing of the meals and the what you're eating in those meals. So yeah. there's there's a lot of variables involved. Yeah, but focusing on women, what research has shown when looking at uh, females and intermittent fasting or um, fat burning runs is like it, the negatives outweigh any positive you can get from that like even so even if a woman let's say she eats dinner she wakes up early because she wants to get a run in before work and then doesn't end up eating to lunch that can have a lot of negative effects and doing that over time you could um you know a woman might gain more body fat especially in the belt in the belly um it could throw off her period um could cause lower energy levels and this is even if she's technically getting enough calories throughout the day just like women are not meant to go through long amounts of time without eating. That's just not how our physiology works. So um, that's one of the things. Um, think, oh, and then also good to note that like at certain times of the month, a woman do burn more calories. And so that needs to be um, counted in because it's only about like maybe 150 calories more, but that is enough where you notice you'll be hungrier and you need to get more calories in, especially if you're training. Um, and women like you, and I was talking about this, um, with a group of women, um, about calorie counting and why there are times that works, but why there's times where that can be very detrimental for females. And also, especially, well, any athlete, because, um, after certain, after key workouts or long runs, like you have to be getting more in cap more calories in and so you know there's dietitians who will tell runners to track their calories but then they get obsessed with a number and trying to control it and not going higher than this number but if you're hungry or you did a big workout you have to eat more calories or else that's going to throw you off eventually um could definitely lead to more injury and and just a whole plethora of bad things so um Uh, malnutrition i mean we see with rates and statistics of of really that there's generally higher incidences of eating disorders uh, with the cohort of female endurance athletes, mm-hmm. uh, especially. And right. I would even say, like, it, I mean, it could strike any age, but especially teenage years, young adult years, uh, maybe when you're still figuring things out, um, it could strike at any age, and it could it occurs in men too. But high rates of disordered eating, and we have that obsessiveness with the calorie counting it could be a, a bad combination and you're trying to run a lot. Um, and like Sandy said, it's a health issue. It could cause all sorts of bone density problems, uh, right. skeletal muscular injuries. And then, yeah, you're tying it in with a restrictive diet. And I, it's funny. I feel like since I'm so much in this world and also just know a lot about female physiology, well, not a lot, I'm not an expert, but I do keep up on it. Um, but there are still, as we know, there's still a lot of coaches that are just so focused on being thin. And this goes for, for males, too. Um, I think Jesse Thomas, uh, Lauren Flashman's husband, he did a good job talking about his experience in college and where he would actually say the male team kind of had a, like an eating disorder thing going on. So um, I really believe like we have to raise awareness to all coaches to make sure we're changing the talk on that. There's a way to talk about eating well and making sure your athletes are healthy without talking about weight or telling somebody they look too heavy. Um, for I, sure. I just think that that's really important. Um, yeah. So yeah. I think for this episode that covers it, yeah. we could just go well, into another episode. Oh, you this got is, more. See, this is why you have to watch body language instead of just watching at the camera. Well, the camera's um, off right now, but yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I was just looking at my reflection in the, the LCD screen. <laughs> But again, um, just to mention a few more things, um, there are certain foods like women should be focused on at certain times of the month, like um, right around your period, there's a more anti or there's a inflammatory response. And so 
focusing on more anti-inflammatory foods can really help like berries um, and also foods with magnesium or zinc, uh, omega-3s like walnuts. Um, and there's also times in the month where women are more like, or more, um, chances are higher to experience hyponatremia. So you have to be careful about hydration. Um, but that's, again, that's a dehy or that's a, uh, low sodium count in the blood exactly. because you don't yeah. have enough electrolytes. You could actually, if you just drink a ton of too much plain water and there's not enough uh, electrolytes in there, you you get to low low levels in your blood. It could be deadly. Exactly. So I feel, and so where I'm at now, as I was saying before, um, it does seem like a lot of information to take in or like when to apply what information. So hopefully I can make a resource that makes simplifies things a little bit easier for female athletes and any coach who wants to use it. Yeah. And speaking of resources, we updated our website, sagerunning. It's not done yet. There's still a lot to work on. We're, yes. I think we're, we're still going to add discounts. some more free content though. Like Sandy yeah. alluded to special things. There are free downloads, the women's first 50 K plan, uh, aerobic base building plan. Um, what other free plans do we have? There's the pace, t- pace intensity spectrum mm-hmm. chart you could download. Uh, we also sell training plans, obviously, for any surface, any distance. It supports Coach Sandy and I a lot. So we really thank you uh, for all that and for tuning in. Uh, follow at Sage Running on social media. Again, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Sandy's at Running Wild. Uh, it's technically Running Wild to believe in the domain. But if you just, search, just, your name, if you just search your name, uh, you'll see it on YouTube. Uh, we'll probably upload this video on the Sage Running channel, uh, maybe on one of our personal channels as well. I'm at VO2 Max Productions. Thank you so much again for, for all your support, especially the Patreon supporters and people just watching this and, and listening. Yeah, anyone who follows Sage Running, you guys help us out a ton. Yeah, hashtag any service, any distance. Sandy's got the shirt on. Um, yeah, that's uh, we sell that uh, design that Sandy hand drew our tagline, any service, any distance logo, mountain design with the track road going up into it. Uh, on uh, we have a link on our website for that shirt. So thank you so much again. Anything else you want to add? Yeah, I just really thank you so much for everyone for listening in. No, it's not always perfect. There used to be things we wish you didn't say or did say later. So, um, but if you like podcasts, and I would like to do more podcast on um, different research stuff that's coming out because I think that's really entertaining for me and I feel I don't know we're, we're kind of nerds we like the science and data and numbers so we do um, but I feel like there's a way to simplify the information to help out and try people. to practice what we preach and I obviously fail in that a lot sometimes too so yeah. uh, but thank you again and stay tuned for more